All right, hi everyone. My name is Brian Robinald, AKA the Pineapple Pirate on Slack and on GitHub. I'm a postdoc in Dan Blankenberg's lab at the Cleveland Clinic. And today I'm hoping to talk to you folks about what we've been doing to bring quantum computing into the Galaxy ecosystem. So first of all, why quantum? Why are people pursuing this? Well, the fact that matters, there's a ton of problems that we can't properly address today. And within that, there's a subset of problems that we can kind of address using classical computers, but a much larger subset is the problems that we could possibly address using both quantum computers and classical computers together. All right, old school computing, we've got binary bits, zeros and ones, right? That is a basic unit bit of information. And then we also have classical logic circuits, which are a set of gate operations on bits. And this is the unit of computation in a classical von Neumann framework. Quantum bits or qubits, on the other hand, a little bit more intricate. Um, just when you look at it, it's basically a sphere. So you have zero and one, I call it the north and south pole, but a bunch of different uh, values in between <clears throat> that are based on spherical and polar coordinates. So just off the get go, there's immediate advantage because your basic unit of information, again, isn't just a binary representation. It can be many, many different forms. And uh, a quantum circuit, on the other hand, is a set of quantum gate operations on these qubits and it's a basic unit of computation. So as the name explains, I mean, these computers use essential ideas from quantum mechanics, one of them being superposition, right? Superposition is uh, creating a state, uh, I guess a quantum state where you have a combination of both zero and one, uh, and these conditions allow us to then map this onto a block sphere. Now, what's really cool is that if A and B are non-zero, then the qubit state contains both zero and one. Um, this is what people mean by saying that, you know, a qubit can be zero and one at the same time. Now where things get really cool is when we introduce entanglement. So if you have two or more qubits, we can get combinations like zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And what this means is zero and one means that the first qubit is zero and the second qubit is one. And then they have their coefficients A, B, C, and D, which are complex numbers. And if two or more of these A, B, C, and Ds are non-zero, then we cannot separate the qubits and they are entangled with perfect correlation and they are no longer independent of one another. This is what Einstein used to refer to as spooky action at a distance. And by the way, the reason why, you know, these zeros and ones have these little brackets and, and uh, pipes around them is because what they really are is their solutions to wave functions. So solutions to Schrodinger's equations written in Dirac notations which is basically a, you know, a solution that tells you the energy levels and the dynamics of subatomic particles, in this particular case of qubits, electrons. Now, another property that's harnessed is this concept of interference, right? So one of the things that makes quantum mechanics really hard, as, especially like for me, is that things are no longer deterministic, right? Things are probabilistic. Um, <coughs> sorry, and interference allows us to increase the chances of getting the right answer while decreasing the chances of getting the wrong answer. And if you're wondering what the hardware actually looks like, this is Osprey, a 433 qubit <clears throat> chip. It's IBM's latest uh, piece of hardware that's put out. All these spheres are your qubits, and uh, the, this is a connectivity map, so the, all those are the gates in between each. <coughs> Sorry. And, you know, obviously there's been a lot of questions like, hey, is this some sort of like Fugazi? Is this actually going to work out? You know, like, is this all just theoretical? Well, there's more and more papers being published that are showing proof that it's actually going to be advantageous compared to classical computers. And IBM put out a paper last month that shows clear advantage by producing much more accurate expectation values compared to classical computers. So it's like one of the first bits of evidence that yes, as we scale things up, it, things are gonna get much, much faster. All right, forget about everything I just said, right? Uh, what exactly makes these machines very special? So every day you got a bunch of stuff to do, right? You gotta work, Maybe you want to travel, maybe you want to make some food. At some point you got to eat, what about some exercise? But the fact of the matter is there just aren't enough hours in the day to do this, right? But what if I were to tell you, you could do all of these things at once? That's exactly what quantum superposition is. What if I were to tell you that you could somehow coordinate what all these different copies of yourself are doing at any given point in time? That's exactly what quantum entanglement is. Now, what if you gave this power to a computer the result, ladies and gentlemen, is the ability to compute things simultaneously, which means you can deal with much, much larger matrices. And by extension of this, you can handle some of the world's hardest optimization problems. And what better optimization problem to try to tackle in biomedical research than the protein folding problem? So like all organic matter, 
proteins tend to adopt the most thermodynamically stable conformation, as we heard very eloquently from uh, Kate yesterday. <coughs> Sorry. And what this means is they adopt the state that has the lowest free energy. Every spontaneous event in nature, I mean, literally anything you possibly think of, from planets rotating around a star all the way to electrons jumping through different energy levels to molecules just changing their shapes randomly to proteins adopting their stable conformation, it all happened with a negative change in free energy. And along these lines, another thing to consider is the second law of thermodynamics, which is the concept of entropy, right? Entropy always wants to be maximized. When a protein folds into its shape, its entropy decreases, right? Because you're going from, I mean, entropy is a concept of chaos when you think about it. And you're going from something that's like highly chaotic, disordered, to fold into more ordered. So you think, well, that kind of violates the whole, you know, entropy being maximized thing. But the fact of the matter is when this happens, the water molecules around it actually adopt a more disordered orientation in the bulk solvent. And this is what actually drives the protein folding process. This is the very basis for the hydrophobic effect, which is the reason why also oil and water don't mix and why the blood things don't cross the blood brain barrier that easily and so on and so forth. Now mother nature always takes the optimal path for protein folding, but computationally as Kate uh, mentioned yesterday, we're really not concerned with that. We're just concerned with trying to find the most optimal solution, right? Because no matter how you get there, it's going to find that low energy state. So we're really, in other words, we're trying to basically get to the bottom as well, no matter what path you dig. <coughs> so just real quickly, why is this important? Did we already solve the problem? Well, no, we didn't. As you know, as it was explained the last couple of days, that programs like AlphaFold that were trained on the protein data bank, which is a database of 200,000 proteins, which is a very, very, um, you know, relatively small amount of proteins compared to all the biodiversity that's out there. I think we've sequenced somewhere around 300 million genomes. Um, these programs don't know what to do when you interact with, I guess, when you give it an anomaly, right? Like uh, some sort of mutation, um, which is good for science, right? If you find a new exotic species or a genome we haven't seen before, it's also good for healthcare. If you have a patient with rare genetic disorders, which ultimately leads to mutated proteins, which means that if you use one of these programs, you're not gonna be able to have an accurate representation of these proteins, therefore it'll be hard to design targeted therapies. So how hard is this problem? It is extremely hard. And that's why you know, programs like AlphaFold were developed because if you try to do this using a physics-based approach, uh, most programs out there that have tried this tap out at around 30 amino acids. So when you think about it, just think of a Rubik's cube, right? I mean, Rubik's cubes are pretty hard to solve. I've never been able to solve one. I don't know anybody who has. I'm not too smart, my friends aren't that smart. But if you keep increasing the dimensions of a Rubik's cube, the problem gets harder and harder and harder. The number of possible solutions increases dramatically and the time to solution really blows up. So to put it in perspective, for a small 100 amino acid protein, it would take approximately the age of the entire universe <coughs> to sample all 3D conformations by the time you get to the most optimal solution. This is, of course, an NP-hard optimization problem. And it turns out that by way of superposition and entanglement, quantum computers are supposed to be better at handling these problems. <coughs> so we're using a quantum algorithm developed by IBM that starts out with a tetrahedral sublattice. So each one of these possible turns is 120 degrees, right? And I know what you're thinking. This is really rudimentary. I mean, amino acids can rotate 360 degrees, but you gotta simplify the problem somehow. And 120 degrees is enough to discriminate between crawling along the path of negative or positive free energy, right? And you want this thing to crawl towards lowest free energy. And it's one hot encoded. So each one of these possible turns you could take, either one, two, three, or zero, uh, is associated with a four qubit bit string, as you can see over here. And uh, there's one qubit assigned for the turn that it actually takes. Now, the mathematical framework, I'm not going to go into too much details, but there's a Hamiltonian. And Hamiltonian really is a fancy word that physicists use to describe an energy function, right? Um, and there's three terms of this Hamiltonian. You have a growth restraint Hamiltonian here, which basically prevents the protein from collapsing onto itself as your computation is growing this thing. You have a chirality constraint Hamiltonian over here, which basically enforces chirality. As many of you might know, chirality is a fundamental property of proteins. But the most important term, in my opinion, is the interaction Hamiltonian, which reproduces the free energy and the potential energy of how amino acid A, a likes to interact with amino acid B. So this is kind of what the workflow looks like. So we, you know, there's this paper that came out in Nature that really highlights the main point. We're not trying to make classical computers obsolete here, but we are trying to give it the hardest 10 to 20% of the scientific workflow. In the case of protein structure prediction, 
It is predicting the coordinates of the coarse grain alpha carbon backbone, so the very rudimentary representation of the protein. So what we're doing is we're handing this off to an IBM quantum computer, and then we're using some Python code that we wrote to convert this to a PDB file. <coughs> then we're rebuilding the all atom structure of the protein, and then we validate it. Um, we compare it to alpha fold or experiment. If it's bad, we rerun it and change a couple things. If it's good, we move forward and run molecular dynamics. And just to look at uh, the initial results, uh, we saw some interesting stuff. We gave it the catalytic site of the Zika virus helicase protein. It's a very, very vital protein. What it does is it un unwinds a double-stranded RNA into single strands, allowing the infection to go forward. Anyways, long story short, we gave this sequence to the quantum computer, and it gave us a more accurate prediction than both AlphaFold as well as trying to run this using a classical solver, brute force, and a heuristic solver, Roby. Uh, it was accurate by almost a factor of two. And what's interesting about this is that this program has never seen this sequence before. Remember, it's not machine learning. It is just simulating the sheer physics of why proteins interact the way that they do. And the other, measure, the other metric that we measure is this concept of the radius of generation, which basically tells you how open or how closed a protein structure is, and as you can see here, when you compare it to AlphaFold, the loop is much more closer in structure to the X-ray or experimental structure, which we hold as the ground truth. Uh, one thing you guys might be asking yourself, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but how exactly does this scale? Uh, well, it turns out pretty well. We have a quadratic relationship in terms of the number of compute resources we need as a function of the number of amino acids or how large the protein is. What I want you folks to focus on is, yes, all three curves are quadratic, but the slope on a quantum computer is much more gradual. So this thing really blows up when you try to do this on a classical computer. And over here on the right, we have the time it takes to generate the icing Hamiltonian. So it's the initial formulation of the problem. It's this giant matrix that contains all the bit strings for every possible configuration that the protein is trying, that you're trying to sample. So I've been working on trying to get a workflow ready. Um, we uh, made a Docker image, uh, thanks to Dan, who did a, the bulk of the work initially. Um, we made a Docker image that contains JupyterLab, uh, Qiskit, which is IBM's software stack. Um, and we're currently, it's currently working, it's implemented. I'm hoping to come up with a final version by the end of the week. And then we take the output from a quantum computer, and then we use all the classical tools to rebuild the structure. And, conduct molecular dynamic simulations, and then basically an entire biophysics workflow is what we're looking at. <coughs> if you have IBM credentials, all you have to do is pass your uh, IBM token through user preferences, and you're good to go. You can submit jobs to a quantum computer from a Galaxy instance. How's it working out? I got about 40% of it working pretty well. Um, so, uh, but most importantly, like, well, I kind of ran into some issues at the molecular dynamics phase of things, but most importantly, the quantum computing part is working flawless. So you pass your API token, you specify the backend, you can use a machine that's anywhere from five qubits all the way to 127 qubits, you can build your circuits, you can have a lot of fun. And the, uh, the way we're doing, the, I guess we're making a Docker image is it actually pulls in all the tutorials from Qiskit. So if you're really new to quantum computer, you can hit the ground running fairly easily with how we're going to implement this. Does this work? Yes, it does. Right on. Uh, so this is uh, what it looks like when it was executed on Galaxy here. I'm sorry, at IBM Quantum Lab at the top. And at the bottom, this is what it looks like when we submitted the job from a Galaxy instance. And as you can see, the final confirmation is exactly the same. Of course, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for a great team. I'm incredibly fortunate to be part of Dan's group. Uh, Dan, Fabio, Jay, these guys are phenomenal programmers. Um, sorry, my screen just died, but that's cool. Um, and it's been really an absolute pleasure learning from them as well as my counterparts at IBM. But <clears throat> most importantly, I want to thank the Galaxy Project, man. You guys are a pretty awesome group of people. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's quite the unique opportunity to be part of this. So thanks to everyone just for being super cool and obviously providing support along the way. I've only been doing this for about a year and a half, man. So I didn't know what an XML file was, you know, before I started all this. I was just used to being stuck in a broom closet, connected to the terminal, running my molecular dynamic simulations, completely oblivious as to how to do any of this. I'm still learning and I'm still annoying, you know, most people, but it's cool. Uh, you guys, the organizers of GCC, I mean, Gareth, Jen, and as the entire Australia crew, this is 
this is pretty cool. I mean, I never in my wildest dreams that I actually think I was going to be in Australia and I'm here and getting to talk science with you folks. This is wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity and the university. I mean, this is a really beautiful campus. Uh, I got to pet a Australian possum the other night. That was really cool. Didn't expect it as I was walking through a campus, nibbed on my finger a little bit, but I think I'm okay. Um, but, uh, oh, and yeah, that's it. So. Uh, up next is Stephen, and I can't read his title, but I imagine it's going to be related to Amble because I came in here quietly to do something in the last training and uh, Mike Nashley and Stephen started talking Anvil and there I lost two hours of my life to a very, very good training session. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for that nice introduction and I'm super excited to be here. Um, and thanks Natalie for giving an awesome uh, workshop on how to do Anvil together with Mike. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk to you in across five minutes really, really fast about how we can plan for costs when doing genomic data analysis and leveraging uh, commercial cloud resources. So, <clears throat> so first, before I go any farther, this is, uh, the Anvil project is a very big project. It is across several institutes in the United States um, and particularly a number of folks that are here today uh, have done a lot of work here um, doing this work, uh, put in a lot of effort to get this work done, and I'm the spokesperson. So what's going on with Anvil and what is that? Well, we're trying to invert the model of how we share data. So in the olden days, you'd create lots of duplicate copies of the data and share it around between different institutions. But we're trying to find a way that we can bring the researchers and the uh, compute to the cloud so that everyone can come and work together on the same data set. So that way we can collaboratively move forward. We've laid out this vision in uh, an article in Cell Genomics. So please do have a look at this where we talk about the Anvil vision and how Anvil can relate to some of the work that's being done in the space of human genetics, genomics, and beyond. So today, I think perhaps we've seen this more than once, um, but very quickly, Anvil is a lot of things, and there are three big pillars that we want to point out. Um, that Anvil is data. This is how you can get access to a ton of human genetic data, uh, and you can pull it together collaboratively with your team, your colleagues, your research lab, as well as people across the country, across the world. And do the data analysis in your favorite uh, tools. So any way that you would normally do it, we want you to be able to do that in the cloud on Anvil. Galaxy in particular, front and center. So again, uh, Anvil is based on Terra, which we can think of as a orchestrator of cloud resources. And by using the Terra data repo, we can pull together synthetic cohorts by pulling together uh, uh, data sets that have the samples of interest that we really want to study. So we can pull them together from publicly available data, from my own data, from your data, because we're collaborating, and then make one cohort and do our analysis. Critically, we can pull in workflows already existing in DocStore, and at a, the click of a button, we can launch an analysis across 10,000 or more samples. And then, of course, we want uh, to point out that you can do the things that you know and love. You can run Jupyter. Uh, you can run Galaxy, your own Galaxy that you don't have to wait in line for. It's yours and ready to go. Critically, this is all in a, a secure perimeter so that uh, we can do this analysis on human genomic data in a way that is consistent with uh, applicable laws and protect the rights of the donors of the samples. Critically, we've got five petabytes of data. Um, across a number of consortia there are the data ingestion team is working incredibly hard right now we are anticipating the ingestion of another five petabytes of data by the end of the year so it's breakneck speed right now um, across the next year we're anticipating maybe a doubling of that and then so now we're looking at 
I don't know, 20 petabytes of data in a year or two, and then together with all of the other data that we're looking to interoperate with across other NIH cloud platforms, that number starts to grow to many, many petabytes. Um, so some really true uh, high-scale uh, opportunities exist here. So we're re-envisioning how we do this computation, and it requires us to re-envision uh, how we're going to fund that compute. So cloud computing has several pay points. You, you got to pay to store data. You got to pay to transfer data uh, to the compute node if it's in another geographic region. Um, and then you have to pay for the node itself for the analysis. And what kind of an analysis do you need to do? So what kind of compute resources should you get? Um, we have access to GPUs, uh, but maybe that's not necessarily the most efficient way to get across the line. Uh, so how can we do this more efficiently? Um, so how can we pull together the uh, information we need to know how to do the analysis that we have in front of us? We have some basic tooling that will allow you to come up with an idea of how much um, to prepare a budget justification and come up with some numbers about how much we need to uh, put together in our budget justification to come up with a plan of how much a analysis will cost, but what are the exact most efficient resources that we want to pull together to do an analysis? So if we take a closer look at the RNA-seq uh, workflow from the Galaxy uh, um, Intergalactic uh, Workflow Commission, uh, we can see that there are a number of steps, and if we uh, stratify this by the input side of size of data, we can see that the time that is required to run this process mostly comes down to cufflinks and RNA star. And if we really start driving in, we can see across different compute uh, architectures that we can bring the runtime down, but it's inversely proportional with cost, right? So uh, critically, um, we can tune a tool's resource to impact its runtime and cost. And modest reductions in time can be expensive over thousands of samples, but inexpensive compute could be really lengthy over sample, a lot of samples. So this might be a really important consideration, fine tuning that for the priority or the urgency of your, your work. And then um, we can enable uh, users to select the most efficient tools by doing this benchmarking. So some tools are more performant than others, finishing the jobs faster with less resources. So if you're gonna choose some aligners, I'm encouraging to look uh, at HiSat it, across different compute configurations and across different sequencing coverage. It seems that we're gonna get the best results there. Okay, and then across different compute architecture, just be aware that that could also cost money. So uh, I want to thank you all for listening. And I apologize for running a little bit over, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. <laughs> Keeping Ollie is up next. We're exporting a very nice t-shirt. Ollie is from Arnet and has been one of our recent partners in Galaxy Australia and part of a very useful collaboration together. So take the floor, Ollie. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? You guys hear me at the back as well? Still awake? Amazing. Congratulations on making it that far. Um, I'm going to present something maybe a little bit different than uh, all the science stuff that's been going through. I mean, it's still science, computer science, but uh, um, does a clicky thing work? Let's try that. Yep. All right. Uh, let me talk a little bit about RNET. I kind of wish, Gareth, tell me what I can do to have the logo put here at some stage, maybe. Uh, we're the Australian uh, Academic and Research Network. Uh, so quickly on this, founded in 1989, not-for-profit organization owned by 38 Australian universities and CSIRO, which is pretty much the biggest uh, research body in Australia. Licensed communications career, which means we can dig your loan to put a fiber in there if we want to. We have the right to do that. Uh, basically, the ISP for all education research institutions and galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. We also provide uh, cyber security data collaboration services, the last one being what put us in touch with uh, Galaxy. Now, just a little bit about me very quickly. Uh, you can call me Oli, whatever spelling. Anything else, I might not really like how you pronounce my name, so just stick to this. Originally from France, there's a lot of French people in the area. Yeah, hello. Uh, I studied telecommunications and networks, systems and networks, spent some time in Japan. 
Uh, ここはね、日本人いないね。No, no one's from Japan here. Not this time. Maybe we can push Galaxy to Japan as well. That'd be nice. I uh, worked at Red Hat, the Asia Pacific Network Information Center, and uh, RNET. I'm a Linux user, Linux forever, since 1997, starting with this thing. If anyone's actually ever seen this, come and talk to me. We'll be friends because, yeah, that's just unheard of. Galaxy at Arnet, it's a partnership. Uh, it started really out of a long-standing relationship we've had with BioCommons before two, uh, 2019. I wasn't part of it yet. At the time, Arnet was involved with the BioCommons for a proof of, con uh, proof of concept uh, that eventually opened the possibility of hosting Galaxy in a more operational capacity. That translated in Galaxy officially moving in parts, again, not the in entire infrastructure, but in parts in March 2022 up and running in May 2022. Yeah, there's a bit of difference, you know, March, May. I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, this is Australia, it's pretty big, okay? Uh, currently here, eh, Brisbane. This is where the data was, and we had to bring it back all the way to here, okay? 3,500 kilometers. Essentially from the POSI supercomputing, uh, supercomputing Center in Western Australia to a website, uh, sorry, not website, data center we have in Melbourne. At the moment, it's hosted between Posey and Melbourne, but before that, it started Uni Melbourne, then it went to QCIF, Gareth fix me if I'm wrong on this, and then it went back to Melbourne. So next step is pushing it to Sydney. Maybe at some point we'll put it in Northern Territories, I don't know. Um, large user data volume, okay, not five petabytes, I'll get back to that later. Uh, only 150 terabytes that we had to transfer, that took forever, so we used Globus, which is a tool that uh, Arnet uh, provides essentially to move uh, data around. So it's currently still running in Melbourne. Uh, we have 99.9% .9 uptime. I might be responsible for the missing .1%, maybe, we'll never know. What's happening next? Well, Sydney. So we have a data center in Sydney that's better connected. We have more security, physical and logical. Newer version of OpenStack. Yes, we're running OpenStack. Not sorry about it. Uh, it's already deployed, it's being tested. What is it made of? Okay. We like hardware. Well, we have a few of these control plane. We, I know some people here know about OpenStack. We have a few of these for uh, compute. We have a bunch of these for disks, okay? Uh, that gives us a lot of disk and RAM and CPU in a few chassis. Network, nothing too fancy, but still running 25 gig per second with NVIDIA and Mellanox stuff. OpenStack, yes, because OpenStack, because private cloud, because AWS, great, but OpenStack, my cloud. I do what I want with it. Uh, lots of internal talent and expertise at Arnet. We actually run multiple large scale and complex deployments, various versions of OpenStack for years. And these are the versions that we run. So we have Foco Wallaby in Melbourne, and next we're going to go to Foco Yoga. We have vendor support for these as well, especially in Sydney. I haven't ding yet, that's good. Um, how we deploy to OpenStack, we use Pulumi. So I've spoke to a few people about that. What it is essentially is Terraform libraries with a Python interface. We could use JavaScript, we could use C something. I just went with Python. It's historically what was used in Melbourne, so I'll start to that. I rewrote it from scratch to use YAML definition, that kind of stuff, so I can have one definition per um, um, client, let's say. And it's tracked in Git, easy to modify, easy to track, et cetera, et cetera. So we have multiple users. Two minutes ding, yes. Uh, we are working with Galaxy predominantly, but we are also working with other people, and we might actually bring CVMFS as well on this platform. More to this, uh, more about this later. We can do a full deploy under 10 minutes for 20 Galaxy VNs with all the network, security, storage, yada, yada. Uh, it's pretty seamless. So Pulumi, not too bad, I must say. When you know what's happening, you know what's happening. Uh, security and performance improvements, base image hardening. All the VMs come from an image that has been tuned. Uh, we have strict OpenStack security groups, host guest performance tuning, get more squeeze, uh, some more performance out of it. Storage, we got some, something more from that as well. Improved authentication, security, and a few other things. Save that for later. Performance testing, because we learned in Melbourne that uh, we needed to enable the hardware enablement kernel. Uh, so this time around, we're testing side by side what Melbourne and Sydney are doing. Tested for network, this CPU. So this is 
One of the problems we have, people ask me, what is the use case? What kind of data is Galaxy using? What's the workload? I'm like, it's every files. At least we know how it behaves. We know it behaves better with one megabyte block size. Uh, base testing's completed. Selenium, Selenium test will happen at some point that new one has written when we redeploy. Future, started already. Hardware in place, configured, deployed, tested. Playbooks adjusted. Thanks so much, so, uh, Justin and Catherine for that. We would be working on migrating, but instead we came to the conference. Uh, continuous user data synchronization, so we don't have to wait a month for it to finish. And we'll do a final Pulumi push when we are ready for that. Testing, switch over when it's all set. Also, user data storing and archiving. I don't have five petabytes, I wish, but no, not yet, maybe someday. Uh, disaster recovery site, improvements to the Galaxy infrastructure, other collaboration projects, it's a priority for us to actually work together with the BioCommons in Australia to get more of this happening. As I said before, CVMF is one of them and other things as they arise. Perfect. <laughs> Just a last personal statement. I want to thank Simon for inspiring me to be part of this journey with Galaxy because as he says, Galaxy is ace. Thank you guys. Uh, Alizera is up next, um, and apologies, I missed the title of your talk, but you're going to tell us all about it in a sec. And I promise this is my last talk in JCC. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is my last talk in GCC. As I said before, my name is Ali Reza. I'm a, full, I'm a software engineer in Galaxy Fiber, and in this presentation, I'm going to introduce you the new Galaxy new notification system in Galaxy. So, uh, in this presentation, I will uh, talk about what is a notification system, in the meaning, and what do we have in, uh, in Galaxy as a notifications, and what types and channels are supporting right now. Uh, at the end, I will do a live demo. You can also do the live demo. I will tell you later how. Uh, all right. So what is a notification system? Uh, in, a, in, in its simplest form, we can say notification system is one of the crucial part of each platform, each, if each software, uh, including Galaxy. And their main purpose is to de deliver uh, the important uh, news, announcements, events, or anything to their users in timely manner. And this is the simplest form I can say. So, uh, I'm doing, doing it so quickly to have a live demo at the end. So, this is a new notification, it looks like, in uh, Galaxy. And uh, as you can see, users can access to uh, all their notifications, see them, mark them as read, delete them, or anything, or filter them. Previously, we only supported uh, via uh, notifications in uh, push, push notification and the email for only job uh, complication. But uh, from now on, we can have more and more things in more areas. So uh, in this new system, uh, you can send uh, notifications in automatic uh, ways. You can uh, schedule them to send them later to the users. You can, uh, as an administrator, you can uh, select individual users and communicate with them or select group of users and communicate with them, uh, tell them some specific things. And you may uh, want to uh, tell all the users something, right? Uh, do, do you have, do you have, you have uh, a schedule maintenance in some day? And then you can use the broadcast and you can also use markdowns to make it more beautiful at links or something like that. So, uh, currently, we are supporting two types in notifications, the message one and the shared item. Message one is uh, the uh, way that administrators can uh, get in uh, touch with the users or, for example, send some, uh, some no notice from a tools or so. Shared uh, item types is uh, that from when, when a user shared something with, an with another user, uh, the, another user gets some notification about what did they share and who did uh, that share with them. For example, they, they, if they share a workflow history page or a notification. 
So uh, we are working to bring more and more channels to Galaxy that uh, makes uh, more conveni convenience for users. Right now we are supporting email and push notification and we are really ha working hard on to bring it to Matrix. And later we can add more and more channel and bring it to the hand of the administrators that then they can customize it for their own users. So that's it. So let's dive into the live demo. You can get access to the instance that uh, has a notification enabled with this IP address or scan this one. Uh, so I'm creating this. Oh, yeah. Let me So if you want to get access as an administrator, use the user Koala and passport one to, one to six. And as a normal user, you can use Kangaroo. Koala. Share the whole screen. Okay. Thanks. So, okay. Uh, this is Koala user who is an ad, uh, administrator of this instance. So, let's send some notification to the Kangaroo one and let me sign in as a Kangaroo to here. Oops, I'm doing it so fast. Sorry. Yeah. So here, just as an example, I'm sending some hi and hey to this user. I can say, okay, just send this message to the role of Congress. And you can al uh, also see uh, what the final notification that the user can take. And here, in this bell, yeah, you see, you got the notification and say hi, or even, for example, I want to share this Lone Pine data history uh, with Koala. Going to the share center and typing the email koala at sign koala dot au. Here, you got a notification that said history shared with you by Kangaroo. This user can grow share the loan API data and you can click on it and you are on it. So, and also as an admin, you can send some broadcast notifications and tell to all the users about, for example, uh, updated terms. And select the variant of that message, like warning info, and it's depend on the, a uh, variant we show differently. Uh, for example, for origin one, we uh, stick the banner to the top. That makes, uh, takes more uh, awareness from the users. And say, terms. Okay, it's done. Almost. And second. So, yeah, we got it. So that's it. And yeah, and uh, at the end, I want to say thank you, David, my lovely colleague from Germany. He's currently in Germany. And yeah, finish. Thank you. Thanks for staying, everybody. So the very last talk, uh, we've saved the best to last, of course is going to be a complete change uh, of uh, direction because we've had four days of incredible display of how Galaxy has been taken and used all over the planet in amazing ways. What I want to talk about in Galaxy's 18th year as a project is how we can sustain the project for another uh, 18 years, maybe. So to do that, um, whoopsie, how do I get my next slide? Right. 
to do that, we need to understand what it is that needs to be sustained. And that means we need to think about what the actual galaxy project is. Now, you all know what galaxy is because you just, just had four days of it. But you know, when you think about what you see, when you think about galaxy, you see communities and there are dozens of them. I just wanna give a few examples of a few possible anatomical categories, as it were, for thinking about galaxy. The communities, the grants and all the hardware that, that, that underlie all of the services that we provide, uh, the dog fooding of the, of the source code, that's been going on since 2005. So the source code is now served at enormous scale as dog food by the used galaxies. That hardens the code and all the user feedback that we take very seriously makes it even more fit for purpose. Every time we get an idea, we try and incorporate it. So those services are an enormously important honeypot. They brought me into the project. And I guess many of you here in this room found Galaxy through those online services. So they're a really important part of the, of, of the way the project succeeds. There's all the open source outputs. We could go on for days about those if we had time. And then we're only just scratching the surface of what's downstream from Galaxy. But you know, the really interesting thing about this exercise is that no matter how you dice and slice, you won't find the project. It's not here yet. All of these things are part of the project, but where's the project? The reason it's so hard to understand is because it's the sum of all the parts in a way, and is more than the sum of all the parts. Because every one of those individual components is independent of all the others. The deliverables can only arise through incredibly efficient work that's collaborative and global and crosses all of those institutional and individual paycheck boundaries. Without that, the, the globally distributed work couldn't possibly function efficiently. And so the most important message that I have for you is that there is somewhere a virtual entity, which we'll call the project with a capital P, that coordinates all this incredibly complex and intricate effort across all of these different institutional boundaries. So if you think about all the things that are going on, our little sample, what I want to sell you as an idea is that the project itself is a kind of underlying communication network that enables all of these components to work together efficiently to deliver all these wonderful, fabulous deliverables that we've been talking about the last four days. And I guess the most important point I wanna make, uh, convince you of if I can, is that our future sustainability doesn't depend on individual components, it depends on the project infrastructure. And I say that because this infrastructure collects, connects all these independent components. None of the independent components has control of any of the others. All the grants, they're independent. No, uh, there isn't a PI who controls all of the grants. So, all of, the, all of that coordination has to happen at a higher level, and it happens because the collaborators all agree that we're going to work through this kind of project entity. And efficient collaboration is surely the, the major element of our next 18 years. I have a public service announcement. Some of you may not be aware, uh, but participation is in your interests if Galaxy is useful to you in your work. It's rational to participate if you need Galaxy. There's this concept of enlightened self-interest, which is sometimes described as self-interest correctly understood, where for, if you wanna keep using Galaxy, you should think about becoming engaged because you'll make the deliverables better by contributing. And those better deliverables will increase in scientific value. That's gonna attract more users that's going to attract more usage. And it's user demand that drives all this global research investment, tens of millions of dollars a year. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's, 
that investment will sustain the project for all users. So it's up to you really to kind of do your bit if you can. And, uh, and there are lots of things that I think we can do where, where your bit is gonna vary depending on what you do. For me, the most important parts of what we need are the project infrastructure to maintain efficient collaboration. Uh, participants, be ambassadors, show Galaxy to your friends. Show it to your boss, show it, run a training session for your lab. Contributors, make Galaxy better for everybody. And the, probably one of the things we really need to focus on is community leadership, because that leads to enormously increased scientific value for all of our users. I'll stop there, I could go on for days, Ennis would yell at me. Uh, and I just wanna thank everybody who's been involved over the last 18 years, because that's how we got here. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for questions? Should we give Ross time for questions? <laughs> yes, we have time for questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's a co-fest. I'm trying to organize a co-fest if anyone cares. <laughs> My alarm, that told me I should stop talking. Uh, so I should stop talking, but there, I'd, I'd like to organize a co-fest. Uh, okay, questions, come and talk to me during the co-fest.